Thanks and good morning, everybody. Del delighted to be here and delighted to have the, the focus on this, this topic of uh, development in, in fragile situations and the question about how the private sector can contribute to development in those situations is something that we've been doing a lot of work on at IFC over the last couple of years. So the only slide I'm going to, to share with you is that picture of the report that we published last year for those who are interested that's available online where we really tried to look at what is different about how the private sector works in fragile and post-conflict situations versus other situations. And you know, the main point is it does work differently and therefore you have to think about engaging with, with private firms differently in those contexts than you would in other low-income countries. Uh, we also have a paper that I co-authored with Paul Collier and Alex Fergusis on the particular role of supporting pioneering firms in fragile states. Again, I'm not going to spend time on it this morning, but it's available on the, the conference website. I'll make a couple of references to it. But instead, um, what Ethan asked me to do was really to give a little bit more of an overview about where uh, development thinking uh, is today about the role of the private sector in, in fragile and low-income states, which may help sort of frame uh, the discussion on this panel. And in doing so, I'll, I'll try to, to be controversial where I can so we don't just end up having one of these dull panels where we all agree with each other. So hopefully not everything I say will be, will be a consensus. So I think where I want to start the story is in 2015, which obviously you know, was a landmark year in terms of the, the, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and also the uh, Agreement on the Sustainable Development Goals. And the narrative around the Sustainable Development Goals was the need to really mobilize private finance, uh, that you couldn't achieve all the investments you needed to close the gaps by 2030 in these various development dimensions without a private financing contribution. And the big number that got thrown around, which some, some probably from the UN produced from the back of an envelope, was two and a half trillion dollars, this huge financing gap that needed to be filled each year for the private sector. And so for the first couple of years after 2015, a lot of the, the focus and the attention was on how do we mobilize more capital to fill this, this financing gap. And I think I would say that here we are, you know, four and a half years on, I think we now realize that that was actually the wrong question. And so in the sense, uh, you know, although this panel is about development finance, I think, you know, we realized that just filling financing gaps is not the answer, just like I think development more generally, we learned many years ago that Foreign aid is not just about filling financing gaps. So it's the same when you think about the role of the private sector. And one reason I say that is because if you look at where the distribution of these, these financing gaps are, we've, we have a, a note which we is also available on our website for those of you who are interested, looking at, well, let's decompose a bit where these financing gaps are. And the key takeaway is about two billion, sorry, two trillion of that, that two and a half trillion financing gap is actually in middle income countries. And in those countries, the incremental tax effort you would need to make to close that gap is actually pretty small. Uh, it's actually within, uh, we think, the ability of government to mobilize most of those resources through public, uh, from public uh, financing to, to fill the SDG gap. So the other f half a trillion dollars is in these low income, fragile economies that we're talking about in this conference, and here's where the paradox is. We talk about getting the private sector to fill the financing gap to achieve the SDGs, but the very place where that financing gap is largest is in the places where it's most difficult to get private capital to go. So there's a little bit of a, a, of a disconnect there. So I think there are two agendas which have emerged on financing the, the SDGs. And one is this, agenda about how do we mobilize more private capital at scale. I think that's had more attention uh, in international discussions in the last few years. And there, I think there has actually been quite a lot of progress. I think we and other development finance institutions now have proved the concept that it is possible to get institutional investors to invest in emerging markets. We have uh, just an IFC, an asset management company, which has raised about $10 billion of equity. Uh, from various institutional investors. We have uh, a co-lending platform, a, a, a syndicated loan platform, which has raised a similar amount on the debt side. We've, we've kind of proved the concept. We know we can attract institutional money into these markets. And I spend a lot of my time 
traveling the world, talking to institutional investors about what will it take for them to invest more in, in these emerging markets. And the appetite is there. What they need is the vehicles. They need the investment opportunities. But the, the investment appetite is there. In a world of very low interest rates in developed markets, investors are looking for opportunities to, for higher investments. These potentially can be growth markets which offer higher return investments. So there has been quite a lot of financial innovation, I would say, uh, various uh, initiatives amongst the development banks to, to mobilize uh, more capital. But beyond that, I think there's also an understanding that if we're going to get more private capital into these markets, we need a much better understanding amongst private investors and much more specifically, much better data availability to actually be able to understand and to model uh, the risk and return of investing in these markets. That, From our perspective, we think private investors often have much too high a perception of risk, and our experience is that the actual uh, risk of investing in these markets is much lower than the market perception. But the only way we'll change that perception is with data. And so one example of that is we have a database that we've compiled amongst the development banks where we have data on default rates and loss given default for uh, for all our loan portfolios, we're now in the process of making that data set available to private investors so they can put that into their risk models. And I think that will be key to getting more private capital to go into these markets. And then secondly, beyond just understanding and having better data on the risk profile, there's then obviously steps to actually de-risk and improve uh, the risk profile of these uh, opportunities. And there, I think, you know, there's, there's two dimensions to it. One is sort of financial engineering, various things you see in terms of first loss structures and guarantees and so on, which just shift the risk from one party to another. More fundamentally, we think it's important to focus on actually changing the, the structure of the underlying investment to actually make it less risky in the first place. Um, but both are clearly important. And then the third thing you see on, on, the, uh, on the investing side is that increasingly there's an interest amongst private investors and in investments which have a clear and measurable impact, whether it's on climate change goals or whether it's on the sustainable uh, development goals. And see, so we've seen a big uh, growth in, in what is known as, as impact investing, and we see that both from the retail market, the high net worth and family offices market, but also in, in many parts of the world, institutional investors are starting also uh, to be looking for investments that have impact that drives them again to emerging markets where the biggest financing gaps are for, uh, for financing the climate change goals and the sustainable development goals. But when we come to these very risky and fragile markets that, that we're talking about today, the challenge then is uh, not so much the mobilization of the finance, but actually making it uh, possible to invest more in these, these very difficult markets. And so you know, my, my colleague uh, Chris Guy will talk more about what we've done to create uh, new blended finance structures which enable DFIs to take on more risk than we could even on our balance sheet by, by leveraging concessional money alongside that. And so that's an important part of the mobilization agenda to be able to go beyond what the development banks and DFIs can even do on our own uh, balance sheets. But if you permit me, I also want to suggest that beyond the sort of this financial engineering and mobilization agenda, that there are three other agendas which we've come to realize are actually equally important if we're going to actually make progress in increasing private investment in these markets. First one of these is work to increase the set of investable opportunities in these countries. What we find is they just are not the investment opportunities there to invest in. We struggle to find enough uh, investment opportunities even to deploy our own capital, never mind what we could mobilize from investment partners, never mind the larger market. And so what we as IFC are having to do is to shift more of our investment team resources from the processing investment opportunities to creating them in the first place. This is what we call upstream uh, work. It can either be in the form of working on developing specific business models and investment opportunities, or it can be broader uh, market reform and market creation efforts that actually creates the economic space in these countries where private investors can, can make money. 
and this is particularly important, I think, in these, these low-income and fragile states where there are many missing markets, there are many very underdeveloped markets. The second agenda is the need for a coordinated approach to investment, and this is what we talk about in the, in the Collier and Ragusa's paper uh, on, on pioneer firms, that part of the reason why it's difficult to find financially attractive investment opportunities in these markets is any one investment on its own may not succeed. You need to get a critical mass of complementary investments to start to get a market moving, to start to get an economy moving, and that's been what's missing in many of these fragile states outside of you know, enclave investments by extractive uh, companies and the like, you often you just get these, these scattered investments and you don't get the synergies uh, and the, the positive spillovers that come from having multiple complementary uh, private investments happening at the same time. And so I think that the DFIs now see this, that we all need to uh, be taking a more coordinated approach and thinking about how we actually complement each other in our activities. And then the third agenda is that you can have all the investment opportunities you like. You can have great markets that you've created, but you still have something missing. What is missing is the, the large formal sector firms who can actually take up those investment opportunities and actually uh, manage and implement these investments. So as investors, you're always looking for the sponsoring company that you're going to invest in. And that is missing in these low-income markets and fragile states. In low-income countries in general, we have some research that will be coming out in the middle of this year where we've looked at the size distribution of firms in low-income countries versus other markets. And we find there isn't a missing middle, as people have often thought, in these countries. There's a missing top. There are much fewer large enterprises, enterprises that employ over 100 people, than you would find in a size distribution of middle-income or high-income countries. And why does this matter? This matters because when you think about where, gross, where, where net job creation comes from, it mostly comes from large firms. SMEs are great for gross job creation, but it's churn. They create a lot of jobs and they destroy a lot of jobs. The actual net increase largely comes from large firms. Almost all the productivity increase comes from large firms. And we know from a lot of World Bank research that the main path out of poverty for people is moving from a low productivity job to a high productivity job. So we need these large firms to increase productivity and to help people move out of poverty. There aren't enough of these large firms. So you're not going to have enough investment without those large firms. So I should wrap up in the last couple of minutes. So let me just make, tell you a little bit about what some of the action steps that we're taking amongst the DFIs on this agenda. I think firstly, you're seeing various types of, of country platforms emerge to try and address this, this need for coordinated approaches. Uh, to actually get a critical mass of investments going. You have the G20 compact with Africa, you have World Bank country platforms, you have UNDP uh, country mapping exercises. It's a little bit of a, a messy space right now, but I think the important point is that people are starting to think about the need to go beyond thinking about individual investments and think in a more coordinated approach. Related to that, we have a work program now between IFC and the World Bank to do country diagnostics where we look at the potential for private uh, investment uh, in key sectors in a range of countries and this provides a common uh, analytical knowledge base for a wide range of investors looking at those opportunities which again we hope will lead to uh, more better coordinated investments and within the World Bank group we have better coordination now between where the public sector invests and, and the private sector invests and uh, a process by which we try and prioritize bringing in private investment uh, where that's possible, uh, particularly in areas uh, like infrastructure. We have a coordination process now amongst the, the DFIs. It just had its uh, second meeting in Oxford last week. So instead of DFIs chasing the same few deals in these very fragile markets, we're now get, getting better coordinated and having one lead DFI uh, take the lead and trying to develop investment opportunities in one fragile state and another DFI take the lead in another fragile state. And lastly, to, to come back to the, the theme of uh, financial instruments, since that is uh, the title of the session, I think the, the, the last area of, of attention for, for action is about trying to support the creation of new large firms and 
support their entry into these markets of new large firms. Conflict leads a lot of firms to exit the market, to move their assets out of the market. So Post-conflict, you need to focus on bringing large firms back in and creating new firms. And in terms of financial instruments, what that means is uh, critically important is the, the role of equity uh, finance and e particularly equity, uh, which is going to be patient capital prepared to invest with little visibility of how long they'll need to be in the company or what the potential returns are. This kind of patient capital in itself is a form of, uh, of blended finance. The concessionality is maybe more implicit than in other forms, but this ability to to take the, those unknowns and, and invest for, for a longer period to establish the, these new large firms that we need in these countries, I think is going to be an important part of the agenda going forward as well. So covered a lot of ground in a short time, but hopefully other members of the panel will get into, into more details and parts of this agenda. Thank you.